So, Jonathan, we're in these beautiful surroundings just outside Aspen, Colorado. Where are we? What is this room we're about to walk into? Well, this is the new campus that just was completed a year ago. We finally have a percussion suite. Uh, before, we were over yonder, uh, which is an avalanche zone. So they, uh, they took us out of the avalanche zone and they put us into the most idyllic spot you could possibly put. Let's see, we have this room. dangerous area where natural disasters could happen. Do we put the violinists there, the pianists there? The, no, we'll put the percussionists over here. So they moved you from the avalanche zone to, to your new home, and this is as of 2013, right? Right. Last year we moved in was our inaugural year. So what does that mean for percussionists who come to the Aspen Music Festival in school to have this space? Well, it's uh, first filled with all the percussion instruments that they need that are essential for studying uh, to become professional musicians, and it's a home. So when we arrive here every summer, uh, everybody's very familiar with the surroundings. We sort of know what is what the drill is, and so we can get up and going very quickly. And uh, the other part is we don't bother anyone, and they don't bother us. Ah, you're far away from, right. <laughs> from the other people. So practicing. far away. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we can hear Castle Creek right here just roaring down the hillside really loud. So I guess that helps mask the sound from getting too far away. Well, that serves more of a purpose than you would think. Um, we have the principal timpanist of the Cleveland Orchestra, Paul Janchich, here. Uh, and he's an avid fly fisherman. Uh -huh. So uh, it didn't take much convincing to get him to return because he was in his waders here about a week ago, <laughs> pulling fish out of the, out of the river and nice. just really having a wonderful time doing that. Nice. So should we step inside and see what profession sure. we've got? Sure, come on in. All right. <laughs> Jonathan, I'm reminded of an episode of The Hoarders. <laughs> this is an incredibly cluttered space in here. So, so this is the percussion studio, yeah? It is, but I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this is home. <laughs> this is just a day in the life of a percussionist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about a few of these toys you've got here. Um, start me off with uh, these, these metal vertical bars. All right, right, so let's clarify one thing. When we talk about toys yes. as percussionists, we talk about the small percussions, sleigh bells, tambourines. Uh, the larger instruments, we don't call those toys. For instance, these are very specific. These are concert chimes, mm -hmm. right? So we, got a, we do have a lot of toys in here, but uh, we'll go with the large instruments first. And this actually brings up a, a topic that percussionists are very sensitive about. Oh, yes, we're very sensitive. <laughs> a marimba is not a table to put your stuff on when you're doing something else in the room. Um, these are instruments, they're not toys. And percussionists sometimes are, are, are not taken as seriously by certain individuals as other members of the orchestra. I would say that's, that's accurate, but we're training everyone. They're getting with the program <laughs> and I think we'll be in good shape in, the, in about 40 years. <laughs> okay, so this is not a toy. These are concert chimes we're looking at. Yeah, and they're really expensive and they're really heavy. <laughs> The chimes are uh, originally from churches, right? And they made their way into the repertoire. Uh, probably the most famous uh, chime part early on was written by Mazorsky in his pictures of an exhibition. Had a very large chime part. Charles Ives is a good example of a composer who wrote a lot of chimes because he was trying to replicate the uh, carillon at uh, the Yale University campus. So they're long tubes made out of metal, and it's very interesting because they have caps on them right up the top. And if you don't hit it on the cap, it sounds like uh, you're at the plumber's union uh, convention, right? So if you miss, it doesn't sound very good. But if you hit it right on those caps, pedal so that we can dampen it so to stop the chimes because you can imagine the racket they're going to make if we're playing them especially if it's very complicated and they all rain together it's just going to be a big mush but with the pedal we can actually play lines and they're also very subtle you can play them very gently
very ethereal. This strikes me as something that somebody seeing this in an orchestra might think, oh, I could do that. That looks pretty easy. But, <laughs> oh, I was afraid of that. <laughs> Here you go. You got your union card on you? <laughs> but there, there are several things that, that make this tricky. I mean, for one thing, and, and then this is just be the beginning of it, you're counting a lot of rest, and you got to be sure to come in at the right place. Right. And you're so exposed. You cannot play a wrong note. You're, you're not like a violinist sitting in the middle of a section of 24 violinists who can be a little sloppy here and there. You've got to nail it, because everybody hears every note you play. Right, exactly. And uh, to, give, to further expand on what you've talked about, where I play the chimes the most is with the New York Pops at Carnegie Hall. And the most nerve-wracking chime part that I have to play every year is at the Christmas concert. <laughs> of course. Right, and everybody's in the holiday spirit, and I'm sweating bullets, right? Because <laughs> you're also not only to play these, they're very tall. So this is a really awkward position. All, the, all the blood's flowing out of your arms. Right, right. And uh, also you're holding these hammers, right? So, you know, a violinist with their very nice light bow. We've got hammers. We're standing up like this. And then there's a big uh, spotlight that shines in your eyes, and the conductor's looking at you like, mess that up, that won't be good. <laughs> right, but I, every Christmas uh, at Carnegie Hall, I... And then all the little children begin to sing. <laughs> but if you don't do that, the little children don't sing. And everyone's disappointed. Jonathan, the very first orchestral concert I went to as a kid was the Oregon Symphony, Portland, Oregon, the old Civic Auditorium. I don't remember what the music was, but I remember that basically the only thing I watched was the timpanist up in the back. I was absolutely mesmerized. And you, you're behind a set of three timpani right now. And again, and this goes back to something we talked about earlier, my eight-year-old self thought, oh, I bet I could learn to do that pretty quickly. <laughs> but there's a lot to it. It's just like learning any instrument, learning the craft and the art of it, yeah? Exactly. This, uh, the, the timpani in the orchestra is the second conductor. So the responsibility, uh, both of the sound that we create and also the knowledge that we have to have of the score and of the music, because we're leading everybody now, arguably, they're all in front of us, and we're in the back, which allows for us to goof around a lot, too, as well. <laughs> but uh, really, this, is, uh, this instrument takes uh, many years of study, and it's the only percussion instrument that the percussionist is responsible for the pitch. Now, all the other instruments in this room, the marimba, the xylophone, the vibraphone, the bars are tuned at a factory by a specialist. But the, the pitches of the timpani are changed and are the responsibility of the timpanist. So if you're playing a Beethoven symphony in E flat major, you've got to tune each drum to a particular note. And over the course of the piece, you might have to change those, yeah? Exactly. And how do you do that? There are pedals right down here. And by uh, raising and lowering the pedal, you're changing the tension on, on the timpani head. days there were T handles. They actually looked like a T and you would have to sit there with your hand to retune the timpani. So if you, it was in Beethoven's time, Mozart, Haydn, uh, they didn't have mechanical drums. They had what we call hand screw drums. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very laborious and also took a lot of technique because very quickly you'd have to sit there and go like this and then play and hope you got the right pitch. <laughs> you'd have to know, okay, three turns on this one, two turns on this one. One and a half on this one to get from G to E flat. You see, you already told a trade secret. <laughs> exactly. That's how we do it. And now, not only do you have the pedal, but you have this little indicator of pitch here, too. All right. Well, uh, I guess, in a sense, you could say now we're a bit busted. Because what this <laughs> indicator has are the notes that we want. So if we move the pedal, say, to a low E, there it is. Now, if we move it up to a G. It's not like a minor third to me. Right, there, there's a G. But the hook 
is that these gauges don't set themselves. So the timpanist has to set the you gauges. You calibrate it. Exactly. So, yeah. And you have to calibrate it before every rehearsal, every concert, because believe it or not, when the oboe gives the, the 440 or the 441, that's going to change over the life of a piece, right? You play a Mahler symphony, some of them last an hour and 20 minutes, and by the time you get to the end of the piece, everybody's tired and the pitch has gone either sharp or flat, depending upon your environment. So the timpanus is always changing. So these mm. gauges are relative, mm. but they do help. I have to admit that uh, <laughs> they, they are our friend and we do use them. But you got to use your ears too. Exactly, because the, you, if the conductor says, timpani, you're out of tune, you can't say, oh, well, my gauge is wrong. <laughs> and they'll say... Uh, or you can't say, I'm right, the rest of you all went out of tune. You're, the rest of you went flat over the course of that Mahler symphony. Right, exactly. And that happens most of the time. Everybody <laughs> else is wrong and we're right. <laughs> so you've got a couple of mallets in your hand. Yeah. Um, is, is there a, a particular timpani part you can demonstrate for us? Uh, sure, I can play the Young Person's Guide to the oh, Orchestra. Oh, perfect. By Benjamin Britten. Benjamin Britten. And that was probably the piece you heard when you were eight it, years it old. It might well have been, yeah. So here come a flood of memories. <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> I feel eight years old all over again. I want to ask you about timpani rolls because I've seen some timpanists do rolls really fast and others do rolls very slowly. Is that a personal choice? Is that, or, or are some rolls diff written differently from other rolls? Well, it, that's an excellent question. It's very controversial. I answered a question like that by looking at physics books and looking at how does a, a membrane undulate and how does it actually have different nodal points. Wait, you're saying there's actual controversy about timpani rolls? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, fist fights and everything. <laughs> but as they, can't we all just get along? I mean, it is a timpani roll. But here, uh, here's an example. There are some timpanists who like to roll with about six inches apart with their sticks. like that. And then there's timpanists such as myself where I use what I call the same beating spot. And the beating spot's the sweet spot. So I use that to the best of my ability. Now I'm of the school that says all of these are really interesting and different. So it's not a oh, wrong, right, or wrong, right. And that's one of the things that I try to do as a teacher is to show everybody all the different possibilities. Then when they go out in the world, they're gonna to have to prove themselves and use the ones that make the most musical sense to their ear. When you were doing in the same way you said, the same beating spot, it looked like there's a danger of hitting the stick with the other stick. Right, it does look like that. <laughs> um, and once in a while, there is that danger, <laughs> okay. and you, you, know, you do that. But with a little bit of practice, actually about 30 years, uh, it's just all based on one stroke. Nice. And one of my favorite things, I love timpani rolled softly. concert hall, when you hear that, you feel it more in your stomach, in your abdomen, than you necessarily hear it in your ears because the frequency is very low. Um, and you know you have a really great role when sort of the audience is looking around like, ooh, where is that coming from? The opening of Debussy's La Mer, that's a really good example. It's the, the ocean is just still calm, and the first sound that you hear is the timpani roll. Mm -hmm. And often they see the conductor's hands moving very slowly, and they feel something, but they're not sure if they're hearing something. Mm. And it's the beauty of that passage. Mm. All right, thank you for the timpani demonstration. There's one more thing I gotta ask you about, and it's across the room, the lion's roar. This looks to me like there was an archery range nearby, and somebody missed the target and hit the drum. 
Uh, exactly, and it's incredible what gaffer's tape can do. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've proved that often as percussionists. But this is actually the way the instrument looks, and this is the lion's roar, yeah? Right, the lion's roar was first uh, used in music by Edgar Varez. And the first time we really saw it was in a piece called Ionization, which we're going to play on our Zappa concert. Um, and there's all different ways of making this instrument, but this is basically a bass drum. And uh, we put a little hole in the head of the bass drum, and there's a stick, a, a dowel rod, that's attached with all this lovely gaffer's tape and sounds like a lion. All right, so what if you, you've got a, just a damp wash yeah, washcloth so, here? Right, yeah? so a wet cloth. Uh, and where the, the idea of, a, it's a friction drum, right? Because it's friction that we're using because this is wet. It really comes from, this is a real instrument. Well, real in the sense that it's got a very long history. And this is called a cuica, it's from South America. <laughs> You hear this a lot in, you hear this in samba. Absolutely, yeah. right. That uh, you'll find this as a Brazilian instrument. We actually do find this instrument uh, in African instruments too. It's a friction drum. But when you put on a larger drum, then you got that so roaring of the line. And and with this, you're making the stick vibrate, and this is amplifying that vibration. Is that what's happening? Here? Exactly. And the shell of the drum which is a natural resonator as well, uh, helps tremendously. Amazing, and that's, we, we've only looked at three of the instruments here. There, I don't know, there are hundreds <laughs> of instruments around this room, and if you're gonna be an orchestral percussionist, you have to learn the art and the technique of every single one of these. Everything in this room, absolutely. Yep, it's a new day and age, and our students are coming to the Aspen Music Festival to do exactly that, to be exposed to and to go into great depth on all these different instruments. Jonathan, thank you very much for your time. My I really pleasure. I appreciate it.